Hello and welcome to the Sharpening the Report. I am your host, Josh Peck. Tonight we have a very special episode for you as we welcome back to the show Timothy Alberino to talk about his new commentary on the Book of Enoch. Glad to have you back, Tim. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's good to be back. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, it's been it's actually been a while. I, I think we did uh, one interview with you while I was over at IGBY with Zach Drew. I was there for about nine months, and I've been here for three or four months here at Prophecy Watchers. So it's been like over a year since we had you on the show. And I'm, I'm glad we're talking about uh, this because the book of Enoch is uh, totally fascinating. Um, so you, your your new commentary, the, the book, it goes through all three books of Enoch, yet it's called uh, Volume One in the Nephilim series. Can you give us some background uh, on what the Nephilim series is and how this commentary fits in? Yeah, actually, my commentary just covers First Enoch, and specifically the Book of the Watchers, the, the narrative portion of First Enoch. Um, the Nephilim series, I've, I'm, I'm publishing this edition of Enoch in collaboration with Nate Henry and Luke Rogers from the Blurry Creatures podcast. And we've created a series called the Nephilim series, which in which we are going to publish uh, various texts, ancient texts related to the subject of Nephilim. And we've got some interesting things in the works. We're not just going to be focusing on Dead Sea Scrolls texts, but also some, some of the, for example, some of the um, material from the Chronicles of Peru, from the conquest of the Inca Empire related to giants, stuff like that stuff related to Sardinia. So it's not just going to be limited to Dead Sea Scroll material. Uh, and we're really excited about it because we don't know how far, how much material we're, we're going to actually have to work with. We have no idea how many volumes are going to be published in this series. But the Book of Enoch is the best place to start. So it is volume one in the Nephilim series. Fantastic. Man, that sounds really exciting. Uh, can you give us some history on the the, the Book of Enoch? What, when and why was it written in ancient times? Why did it disappear for a while? And how did it come to be uh, rediscovered? Well, let's focus on First Enoch. Um, sure. Because as most people are aware, there are actually three versions or variants of Enoch. And they differ widely. First, there are some similarities between Second Enoch and First Enoch, but Third Enoch is an entirely different animal altogether. Uh, it, it, Second Enoch and Third Enoch are unquestionably the product of what's called Merkaba mysticism or chariot mysticism. It's Second Temple mysticism, and they clearly reflect the thoughts of, of the Merkaba cult. And Merkaba basically revolves around, it's also called throne room um, mysticism. It revolves around, it revolves around the sacred names of angels and invocations. And it's, uh, as I said, it's, it's Jewish mysticism. And second and third Enoch are also distinguished in that they are most certainly, they were most certainly created, published, and circulated after the birth of Christ. Now, First Enoch distinguishes itself in two ways. Number one, much of the content was, was published before the birth of Christ, and that is not disputed among scholars. Scholars agree that much of the content content of Enoch was was definitely published before Christ, before the birth of Christ. That's very important because what first Enoch does that second and third Enoch really don't do is it is it makes remarkable predictions, Christological predictions, messianic predictions about the coming Messiah. Predictions which are clearly fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth. So if those predictions were indeed written, recorded before the birth of Christ, and then you have the Son of God walking among us, fulfilling those predictions, then you have an authentic, you have a, a mechanism of authentication built into First Enoch. 
to at least authenticate some of the content. Now, I keep saying some of the content or much of the content because First Enoch is a convoluted manuscript. Most of us are familiar with the Ethiopic version that was written in, in Giz, or Giez, the liturgical language of Ethiopia. And that is certainly not the complete edition of First Enoch. There was an, there was an, clearly there was an ancient version of First Enoch that was circulating during the early church age because you have some of the early church fathers, such, such as Anthenagoras, who are quoting from a version of First Enoch that we don't apparently we don't have today because there are there are segments passages that are being quoted that are not in the Ethiopic. So First Enoch, the Ethiopic Enoch, is convoluted. It has more than one author that's apparent, and there are some changes in the narrative that happen within the the within First Enoch within the same manuscript. So we need to be careful when when handling First Enoch in regard to its dating, because some of First Enoch was written before Christ, was recorded, published before Christ, and some of it probably was published uh, A.D., um, was published after Christ, the birth of Christ, and that would be the latter portions. Those would be primarily the latter portions of Enoch. So the, the earliest portions of Enoch are are known to be the Book of the Watchers, which is the first portion of Enoch, and that is the the Book of the Watchers is the narrative. It contains the the, the story of the Watchers, and then and then you have the parables, and the parables also are the earlier versions encompass the earlier versions, the earlier portions rather of First Enoch, and the, and it is within the parables that you have this remarkable Christological content, uh, which actually which actually forms some of the foundational, which, which establishes some of the, uh, let me use the word buttresses, some of the foundational Christological doctrines that are espoused by the apostles in the New Testament. So the, the, the apostles are clearly drawing from the Christological content in the parables, in the formulation of their Christology. And indeed, Jesus himself, Jesus of Nazareth himself, references, not directly, indirectly references Christological content, especially within an eschatological context, uh, in regard to himself. And this happens on several occasions in the gospel. So we know that the earliest portions of Enoch, of First Enoch, are written before Christ, and in fact may have been written in the antediluvian world and preserved through the flood, as Tertullian um, s- speculated, or as Tertullian speculates further, that they were um, reassembled. That the story of Enoch was was reassembled by the best recollect- recollection of the early fathers uh, under the inspiration of the Spirit. This is one of the argumentations that um, Tertullian puts forth in his defense of Enoch. And Tertullian was, of course, a, a, uh, one of these staunchest defenders of the faith in Carthage. And uh, so there's, it's just a, it's a remarkable manuscript. And again, let's, I'm not, I'm not very, interested in second and third Enoch, although I do publish second and third Enoch in, in, in my edition of Enoch, just so that people can have it should they desire to read it. I'm not very interested in second and third Enoch because, again, it's Merkaba mysticism and it's written after Christ. And, and it's, it's interesting in evaluating and analyzing second temple thoughts and, um, and some of the escalation eschatological thinking of the Second Temple writers. Um, I'm primarily interested in First Enoch and and most interested in the first two sections of First Enoch, the Book of the Watchers and the Parables. And, and after the parables, you get into the courses of the heavenly luminaries, you get into the dream visions and, and all of that content. And there's fragments of the Book of Noah also that are intermixed into the Ethiopic version of First Enoch. And all of this comes in the latter portions of Enoch, which, as I said, there's clearly a different author or authors. 
and you still have um, chariot, the influence, the clear influence of chariot mysticism mixed into the latter portions of Enoch. So it's, as I said, it's convoluted, it's complicated, and it's not sort of a one size fits all, like second and third Enoch are not, you know, authentic. And first Enoch is authentic. You know, people want to reach for those sort of easy explanations when in fact, first Enoch itself is very complicated. Mm. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, you mentioned the book of the Watchers. Most people watching are probably familiar with uh, Genesis six and uh, the story of the Nephilim, but we find a longer telling of that account in the book of Enoch. What extra details uh, do we find in Enoch concerning the Watchers and the Nephilim? Well, it appears to me, and you, you, there's two different thoughts on this. Most people, most scholars, will assume that the story of the Watchers in First Enoch is derived from the reference in Genesis 6. In other words, the author of Genesis penned his, he penned those first verses of, of, of Genesis 6 before the book of Enoch was written. Um, I actually take the opposite view. I believe that the author of, of Genesis, and I say the author because we don't really know who wrote Genesis. We assume it was Moses, but that's not ironclad. Uh, the author or authors of Genesis, when they write Genesis 6 and they talk about, you know, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful or comely and so forth, that that author is drawing on a more ancient narrative. He's, he's literally, in some sense, copy and pasting directly from the book of Enoch. So I think that the that the book of Enoch, at least the oral tradition of Enoch, if not, and I would I would go so far as to say that the the scroll of Enoch, the actual literature of the book of Enoch, was in existence and circulation before the book of Genesis. So that the author of Genesis is directly drawing upon a narrative that was already widely known to the to the ancient Hebrews, and in doing so. Because the story is so well known, he doesn't have to explain what he's talking about. All he has to do is make reference to the story, and everyone knows what he's talking about. Everyone understands what he's referencing because uh, the story is so well known. And is and, and not only is it well known, and of course we're talking about the story of the Watchers contained in First Enoch, not only is it well known, it's more than just well known. It is fundamental to... Hebrew cosmology. It is. It lays the groundwork for so much uh, of the. It lays the groundwork for for. Um, for so much of the content that we have in the Old Testament, in regard to. The. Cosmology of the ancient Hebrews. So. Um, the story that is referenced in Genesis is enlarged upon in Enoch. And this story revolves around, it revolves around a company of 200 renegade watchers. And of course, the, the watcher designation is not unique to the book of Enoch or the Dead Sea Scrolls. It actually appears in the book of Daniel. It's the only place it appears in the Bible. But it is in Daniel, and and there's a very interesting reference to watchers in Daniel to kind of get an idea for us to, to have an idea of what a watcher is. Daniel really provides us with a very good reference to the watchers, and and this is in this this reference concerns Neb, Nebuchadnezzar, and it's that famous scene in Daniel where Nebuchadnezzar is is being judged by a by what the late Dr. Heiser would describe as the members of the divine council, because it's not Yahweh alone who's sentencing, who's judging Nebuchadnezzar. It is the holy watchers. So you have a council of watchers who are apparently members of the divine council, who are apparently very high-ranking angelic beings, and they are presiding over the judgment of Nebuchadnezzar. And, of course, they sentence him to madness. And he, for a period of time, he's driven mad. He's given the mind of a beast, and he's out in the field eating grass to humble him, to humiliate him, really. And Daniel is the intermediary here 
between the watchers and Nebuchadnezzar. So the watchers are using Daniel as the intercessor, the intermediary, and he plays this role. Uh, he's interfacing with the watchers of heaven, and he's communicating to Nebuchadnezzar, right? Well, this is exactly what happens in the book of Enoch, but with, but with Enoch. So you have, you have, in the book of Enoch, you have these, this council, this divine council, these watchers of heaven, holy watchers of heaven, who are passing judgment, but this time not on a human king. Rather, they're passing judgment on their own compatriots, on a faction from their own group who have defected and descended to the earth and, and, and wreaked all kinds of havoc, havoc on earth. And instead of Daniel being the intermediary between the, watch, this, the heavenly watchers and the, and, the de, and the defected watchers, it's Enoch. So it's very interesting because you have this correlation between the, the watchers in Daniel and the watchers in Enoch. The same sort of procedure is happening here. But again, in Daniel, it's the watchers are judging a human king. In Enoch, the watchers are judging their own compatriots, right? So it gives us insight into who the watchers are in the book of Enoch. These are high-ranking members of the divine council. Or we could, what we might say is that these are, um, this watcher class of beings, these are members of the royal family, I think is another accurate way to designate them. And 200 of them decide that they are going to defect from the kingdom of heaven. And I, I and in, in the, you know, this, um, my commentary on Enoch, it, it really is, it is an expansion of my commentary on Enoch in my book, Birthright, right? So in Birthright and in my commentary on Enoch, I identify three catalysts, the three primary catalysts for the watcher's insurrection, for their defection from the kingdom of heaven, for the mischief uh, that they engaged in on earth. And, and, and the first is noted both in Genesis 6 and in Enoch, first Enoch chapter 6. And, and in Enoch, it's a little more descriptive. The watchers lusted after the daughters of men. They lusted. That's the first cause of the watcher's transgression. That was the first motivation. They lusted after human women. And this is, of course, what is intimated in Genesis 6. Then the second, the second catalyst is that they desired to procreate. So they weren't, they weren't just wanting to have sexual intercourse with these women. They actually wanted to procreate families, offspring. They wanted to have families. So they lost it after, after the daughters of men. That's the first cause. Second cause, they desired to procreate with these human women, and progenerate offspring on earth. Those two causes are apparent in the text. Uh, I think apparent in Genesis 6, but also certainly apparent in First Enoch. And then the third cause of the watcher's defection is inferred. And that is that they wanted dominion of the earth through the agency of their hybrid Sons. So they so they lusted. They wanted to progenerate sons pro, through the through the through the through procreation with these human women, and and by the way, they wanted to wed them. They didn't just want to copulate with them. They wanted to take them as wives, which is a very important detail. And then they would progenerate these offspring, these hybrid sons, and through through their hybrid sons, they would govern the earth. They would take dominion of the earth. And that third. That third point, as I said, is not directly apparent. It is inferred. So this is exactly what the watchers did. And again, this is a very, these are very important, powerful entities in the kingdom of heaven. These are the holy watchers, and it's a company of 200. And so I'm sure as your audience is well known, as, as, as your audience well knows, they 
they decided to before they before they went and executed this plan of theirs they they decided to bind themselves by mutual imprecations to take an oath you know basically the oath said that we're all in this together we will all pay the penalty for this great sin and they bound themselves together and they descended to Hermon and that and and Hermon in ancient times was known because of this as the mountain of oath and uh and so once they bound themselves with this oath they descended into the plains and they began to choose from among the daughters of men each one of them a wife and i you know there's some debate by people who are interested in in Enoch this the the Enochian narrative as to whether they took these women by force or not and i don't believe they did and in fact i found it interesting actually reading through some some of heiser's commentary the other day not on enoch but uh, in his book demons to i found it interesting that 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 heiser and other scholars negate the idea that the women were taken by force rather they were chosen so i i envision this as the watchers sort of maybe cloaked walking through the villages and just sort of observing observing the women and in their minds choosing which one they wanted and then the procedure in the ancient world you it wasn't like today you go and drop to your knee and propose to a woman that's not how it works you didn't go to the woman you went to her father so you went to the father and you made a proposition to the father which usually involved a dowry i would like to uh I would like your daughter's hand in marriage and here's what I'm going to offer you right and if the and if the father deemed the suitor um to be of high enough as, to be uh suitable uh and the dowry to be suitable the payment for the bride then the then then the wedding would be arranged right with all of the pomp and ceremony that was that would accompany such such an event in the ancient world and so i think this is the procedure that's happening with the watchers they're not throwing women over their shoulders and raping them that's not what they wanted to do they wanted to marry them they wanted to take them as wives so they would have approached the 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 fathers and made a deal and this is so it's transactionary and this is a transaction i think is again inferred in the story the 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 fathers of the brides of the maidens in in exchange for their hands in marriage would receive knowledge concerning uh, would receive knowledge um from the watchers and this was knowledge according to the book of Enoch that they were already striving to learn so they had questions they recognized the watchers for who they were right the sons of god the watcher the holy watchers of heaven and obviously these were suitable husbands for their daughters and ex- and in exchange for their daughters hands in marriage they were given knowledge which amounted to functional technology that's really what we're talking about here and so uh the watchers wed their wives and i'm sure again that this would have happened according to the customs of men with all of the, the the ceremony and celebration and they copulated with them and the women conceived and gave birth to giants which i think was completely unexpected by by the women and by their fathers and the men the watchers did indeed they fulfilled their end of the bargain which of course was a faustian bargain they they instructed the men the 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 offspring of adam the 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 probably in my estimate and this is just me speculating here in my estimation probably men in the line of cain they taught them the secrets of heaven the knowledge that they were striving to learn and long story short the men became corrupted with the knowledge the women gave birth to giants the giants grew to to exceedingly large height began to devour men began to um engage in cannibalism and to devour mankind and then uh, a judgment was 
was passed on the on the watchers and their offspring which resulted in a in a great war a, a hybrid a, a, a war of, a, fratri- a fratricidal war uh between the giants which culminated in the flood and that's just a you know a very clumsy uh summary of the story but that is the story that's told in in uh, the book of Enoch in first Enoch yeah and speaking of the flood one of the biggest questions that a lot of people have we see giants uh we we see them return after the flood does the book of Enoch shed any light on uh on how that happened how the giants returned again after the flood was it another incursion or was it some other method what what are your thoughts on that it doesn't um, it doesn't. The Book of Enoch is interesting in that it, it 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 weaves this really incredible narrative, but it doesn't it doesn't really complete the narrative. That's one thing that's always very bizarre to me. And maybe it does in a more ancient manuscript. Again, there was a different manuscript circulating in the ancient world that had some variations. But the Ethiopic Enoch doesn't complete the narrative. It's very strange. So you have the judgment. It doesn't even directly reference the flood uh, as that final culminating action uh, in regard to the judgment. But uh, it, it does indirectly, but it doesn't like end the story with the flood or anything. The story kind of ends with the judgment of the watchers, with the proclamation. And then it goes into all kinds of metaphysical content. It launches into the dreams and visions and heavenly luminaries and all this kind of stuff. So it doesn't really complete the narrative, which is a little frustrating, but, and, and so it doesn't tell us, tells us that the giants slaughtered each other, but it does not give us any insight whatsoever into, of course, that, that bizarre comment that a bizarre addendum to the passages in, in Genesis 6, where it says that giants were on the earth or the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also after and also afterwards, right? When the sons of God went into the daughters of men. Um, and that also afterwards is assumed to mean after the flood, because the next chapter is the flood in Genesis. Genesis 7 is the flood, right? And Genesis 6 pres- provides the catalyst for the flood, and the catalyst for the flood is the activity of the watchers of the sons of God. So, no, we're not we're not giving any 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 insight at all in the book of Enoch as to how, um, at least in First Enoch, as to how the Nephilim, the let's say the the genetic lineage at least of the Nephilim, makes it through the flood. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, that's something that I've always uh, wondered about, too. A lot of people have. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Just need a few minutes of your time at home, everybody, and we'll be right back with more from Tim Alberino. Stay tuned. I, w- I would ask that you go visit dailyrenegade.com and become a member uh, today. Not not only do you get early access to, to full videos, but there's a lot of things I just can't put out on YouTube for fear that they'll delete videos or delete the entire channel, and I I can't put the channel at risk. There are certain things, and those of you who have followed me for a while know, there are certain things that I've made documentaries about that I cannot mention uh, on YouTube or my entire channel will get removed. So this is why I created Daily Renegade. It's a place where we don't have to worry about censorship. You can go, you can watch all the videos, you can watch the full videos of everything, and there's even a community tab that works pretty much exactly like Facebook without the censorship. So members of Daily Renegade, we can all communicate with each other. You can post, you can put pictures up, you can uh, make your own account. It's it's really exactly like Facebook. There's just no censorship. Um, now, again, I do run the site. If I see somebody cussing somebody out, I'm going to remove them. But so far, I have not had one problem with trolls because, let's face it, trolls are pathetic, right? They're not going to spend their own money to go and troll somebody. They'll just do it for free on YouTube. So we'll leave the filth with YouTube at, at dailyrenegade.com, uh, we're actually creating something really nice. We And so the video uh, section works exactly like YouTube. It looks really, really similar. It has the same layout. You get your own profile. You can favorite videos. You can share things. You can comment. I mean, it has the same layout as YouTube. It just does not have the censorship. And uh, 
And it's the same with the community tab. So at dailyrenegade.com, yes, there is a membership fee because there has to be. I'm not rich. <laughs> I didn't get into full time ministry to become rich, you know. Um, and uh, so I, I can't afford to do it all on my own. Uh, so there is there is a membership, but that that goes that goes towards keeping Daily Renegade afloat. Um, uh, but but also uh, it, it it helps with what we're trying to do. We want to make a uh, a phone app and a TV app so that Daily Renegade will be even easier to access. Right now, you can go on your phone and just go dailyrenegade.com, and it works great. It works beautifully now. Uh, we had problems with an earlier website that we went through a different service. Uh, we went through Wix, and we got rid of that. That's done. Um, so if 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 you if you're happening to happening to view this and you're thinking, oh, I remember that site from two years ago and it was awful, I couldn't do anything. Please, I'm I'm asking you, give us another chance um, because we have we have fixed all that. We we fixed all the junk. We uh, it was expensive to do, but it's it's because of people supporting Daily Renegade, getting memberships and even donating that we're able to do that. Uh, so it works great now, and now we want to take it to the next step. We want to make a phone app, and we want to make a TV app. We're still collecting donations, so many of you know the situation. I'll run through it very briefly. Um, two main things. Uh, one, two weeks before I got the job offer here for Prophecy Watchers, my wife and I had bought a house in Illinois. And once we got the job offer here, we knew it, we knew it was a calling from God. We knew it. And so we, we had to take it, and it, it's it's great. I mean, I, 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 love, I love working at Prophecy Watchers. I love everybody there. It feels feels like home. Feels like a family, and it's it's just it is a perfect fit for us. Uh, but the problem is we are renting a house here in Oklahoma, but we still have a house that we're trying to sell in Illinois. By the way, if you're in the Decatur, Illinois area and you're looking for a really nice four bedroom house, uh, let me know. Josh Peck Disclosure at Gmail dot com. It's it's for sale now, um, but. But in the meantime, we don't know how long that house is going to sell. Sell, And anybody who knows anything about the economy knows this is a really bad time to try to sell a house. So it's been very difficult financially. It's been financially straining. Um, and especially since, you know, uh, Illinois got hit with some storms and we had to we had to pay for to pay, pay to fix some damages there and stuff. We, we had to put a lot of money into it. Um, so while we're while we're paying for a mortgage there, we're paying for rent at this house. So basically we got two huge payments and I don't know how long that's going to last. The second our house sells, I, I, I will tell everybody on here, okay, we're good. You don't have to donate. Well, you don't have to donate at all, but, but we, we, we no longer need donations uh, for our living situation. Um, uh, so we are accepting donations uh, for that. We're also accepting uh, because we, we, we have a big family. We, um, we have five kids and we're, uh, we're a single income house. You know, Christina stays at home, takes care of the kids, homeschools them, works really, really hard. And then, uh, I do my ministry work at Prophecy Watchers. And then I, on my, on my off time on that, I work on Daily Renegade stuff. Um, and anything that I make from Prophecy Watchers and Daily Renegade, that's it for our entire family. Uh, so once our house sells, it's going to be fine, but we just don't know how long that's going to last. Prophecy Watchers has helped out a lot, but again, uh, we don't know how long this is going to last. So until the house sells, I have to keep bringing it up and say, hey, if you feel led and if you want to donate, uh, that would be extremely helpful. Um, best place is paypal.me slash Josh Peck Disclosure. If you don't want to do that, I do have a cash app. It's dollar sign Josh Scott Peck. Uh, if you want to mail, mail in something, a couple of people have mailed in uh, checks just addressed to me to the Prophecy Watchers building. I don't have the exact address. I think it's, I, I don't, I don't know what their appeal box is, but I think it's on their website. Um, so if you just want to go to prophecywatchers.com and look where to actually send in and look for a PO box where to send in um, or, or an address. Uh, I, I know the physical address of the building, but I don't know if that, I honestly don't know if that's been made public and I don't want to make it public if it hasn't. So I'm not going to do that. Um, also, we're accepting, still accepting donations for my son's health care. Very brief synopsis. He, uh, he had cancer for years. Um, we took him to St. Jude's, got it cured. Uh, but the 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 chemo destroyed his immune system, and he's got a lot of long-lasting health issues because of that. So to reverse those health issues, 
Um, Christina actually got her degree uh, because of this whole thing in natural health and medicine. And so we're going the all natural route. But that stuff is really expensive. Those treatments, those supplements, and I'm not talking about just supplements off of the shelf of Walmart. A lot of that's garbage and it's not even real. But to actually get the real stuff that your body like needs to heal, it's so expensive um, and insurance does not cover it at all. So, uh, and, and there's also medical treatments and things like that that he needs. Very, very expensive and we're having to pay out of pocket for that. So again, for my family, I don't like having to ask all the time. And I'm not ever going to impose on you that you have to donate. You don't. You really don't. I would love it if you'd at least pray, though. That any, Anybody can do that. Um, if you're watching this video, you can pray. At least pray that, that, and God has been providing. He's been doing great. But, you know, just pray that that continues. Pray for our wisdom. Pray for Nathan's health. Pray for our house to sell. You know, there's a lot of things you can pray for that would help. I don't love having to bring this up every single time, but for my family, Absolutely, I'm going to do that. I'll, I'll, it, it, it's Especially if you're a man, you know it's not easy to ask for help. It, it's not easy to just put your personal details out there and admit when you need help. It's not easy. But I'll do anything for my family, and I'm sure you would too. So, yeah, every single time I do this, every single time I get comments, I get emails, I get people that get annoyed that I'm, bringing, that I'm even bringing it up. And I'll get, I'll get comments that say, well, the gospel should be free. The gospel is free. I'm not selling the gospel. I, I'm not telling you that you have to give anything. You don't. But if you feel led, you know, not just for me, you know, for my family, for my kids, if you feel led, it would it would be incredibly helpful. And I'm not I'm not going to promise that you're going to get anything from it. Um, that's up to God. Uh, I'm never going to be the kind of guy that says, you, you know, sow a seed and, you you know, if you do this, God will reward you. I don't know what God's going to do. Um, and that shouldn't be why you give anyway. You, you should never give to get a reward for yourself. If if you're giving because you're expecting God to to reward you in some way, I'd rather you just not give at all, because that that's that's like spiritually dangerous territory for you to be in, and I, I would suggest getting getting some actual good, solid foundational teaching of uh, of the teachings of Jesus and what he means when he says when when he when he tells us to give with a cheerful heart and all that stuff. You don't expect things in return, but again, do it if do it if the Lord leads you. If not, no worries. Just, just pray. If you can pray, that'd be great. So again, paypal.me slash Josh Peck Disclosure or Cash App, uh, dollar sign Josh Scott Peck. And we have not set a P.O. box up yet, but we will very soon. I actually just keep forgetting about it because we have so much stuff to do. We have so many things day to day that we have to we have to focus on. Um, we're, we are still in that transition period, uh, but we're, we're, we're getting through it. And actually, it's it, it's it's really been great. Um, I do have some other links and things in the description below. Uh, I did recently take part in a webinar that's available or will be available at the end of May, I believe, uh, at paulbegleyprophecy.com. And I talked about upcoming uh, magnetic pole shifts, what that might have to do with prophecy. Talked a little bit about geographic pole shifts, uh, how all of this relates to Bible prophecy, a lot of revelation in there. Um, so I'd suggest checking out that webinar, Paul uh, Begley prophecy.com there's also an orlando prophecy summit that's on demand right now and if you use uh use the promo code peck orlando 24 all caps all one word and uh then you'll have full access to all videos and speakers this is a prophecy watchers conference um and for more information on that you can go to orlando prophecy summit.com or prophecywatchers.com uh, also, if you haven't had a chance, check out Cornerstone Asset Metals. The economy is not great, and the value of our dollar is dropping by the day. So what we should do is invest in something that's more stable, like silver and gold. But the problem is there's a lot of scammers out there. There's a lot of people you can't trust, even people calling themselves Christians that you can't trust because they mark up their prices. Um, Cornerstone doesn't do that, and if you look at any interview that I have on my YouTube channel and at DailyRenegade.com with Terry Saka, uh, Look at any of his interviews. He, he he's a prophecy guy. He's a Nephilim guy like us. You know he he knows all this stuff, uh, and he treats his his business as a ministry. He's doing this as a service for brothers and sisters in Christ, especially when they're retirement, their four hundred one k. You know your investments, um, even just your savings are in danger. Uh, so go to cornerstoneassetmetals.com. Tell them that we sent you, and you can get a free report. You can ask questions. They're not salesmen. They're not going to be pushy with you. You can talk to them about Nephilim if you want to. You know they're they're knowledgeable. They know what they're talking about, uh, and they're not they're not they're not going to scam you. 
I've been working with them for years. I don't promote very many companies on this channel because it's specifically that. I've got to actually really know and believe that uh, and know firsthand that it's a solid company because I don't want to put all of you at risk. Uh, and I fully believe that about Cornerstone. Um, we've talked a little bit about prophecy. Uh, we do have a Dead Sea Scroll, uh, Scroll prophecy calendar, a print calendar that you can put on your wall that tells the regular Gregorian date that we go through and then has the Dead Sea Scroll prophetic calendar um, that I talk a lot about in my upcoming books, but also talked about in Lost Prophecies of Qumran. So if you want a print version of that, the link is in the description below. Okay, so I think that's it. All the donation stuff, everything. Uh, and again, I apologize that that takes a long time to get through sometimes, but again, I'm, I'm doing it, especially the donation stuff, I'm doing it for my family. See how fast I whipped through the rest of it? Because that's that's more, hey, if you want a calendar, buy a calendar, great. You know, it, it does help support um, me, my family, my ministry helps support Ken Johnson's uh, ministry as well. Um, you know, if you want to, if you want to trade your 401k or your retirement into silver, I think it's a very, very, very smart thing to do. I think you should do that. But, you know, again, it's it's just what what won't you do for your family? If, if I have to deal with some mean comments of people saying that, oh, he's just money grubbing, and no, I'm not. You don't, you don't have to give me anything. You don't got to buy anything. I'm still going to be putting free information out on YouTube. But if I have to deal with that and then the, the good-hearted uh, – people of you who feel God calling you to give and you, and, and you do give, and that helps my family, of course I'll go through that. It's, it's very, very minor, minor persecution, you know, compared to uh, stuff that other Christians are going through today. It's, it's very, very minimal. All I have to do is just not read the comments, which typically I don't uh, on YouTube. Um, but but that's that's the reason. It's just I'll do anything for my family, and this is, this is one way that'll help. So, okay, let's get back into it. All right, welcome back. So uh, when looking at the, the timeline here, why why exactly, and I know that there is a difference between Christians and Jews here, but why exactly was the book of Enoch excluded from the Bible? Why don't we find that in our Bibles? Well, we can only speculate as to why it was excluded to some extent. We know that the church fathers decided to exclude Enoch. One of the reasons they decided to ex exclude Enoch was because the Jews had excluded Enoch from their canon. And the Jews primarily, if not exclusively, only inducted texts which were written in Hebrew. That doesn't mean that the book of Enoch was rejected on grounds of it not being written in Hebrew, because as I said, there was a version circulating that we don't have today, and it might have been in Hebrew. So we, we don't know. We don't know if that's the case. So, But um, the other reason why texts were excluded both by the, presumably by the Jews, but certainly by the Christians in their canon of Scripture w w was if the authorship was in doubt, if the authorship could not be confirmed. Now, this really isn't that big of a deal because we have several books in the canon that we still to this day don't really know who the authors are, including the book of Genesis. It was commonly assumed that the book of Genesis was written by Moses, but, but there's a lot of disputation on that point because Moses died and the narrative continues. So obviously somebody else, Moses wasn't writing the latter portions of Genesis after he died. Obviously he's not going to write about his own death either. So, so portions of Genesis might have been written by Moses, but certainly not the entire text. So there we have an, a questionable authorship, and yet Genesis is clearly inducted into the canon, into the Christian and Jewish canon. And there are other texts as well um, that are the, whose authorship is debated to this day, several. So authorship was another thing. Um, but I think that the real contention revolved around the content. That seems to be the real point of contention is, is that the, the Jews, and there's, there's some reason to believe that Second Temple Jews were not sympathetic to the idea of, quote-unquote, fallen angels. They didn't like that. They didn't like the idea that 
holy angels could rebel. And furthermore, not only rebel, um, and when I say holy angels, I'm talking about watchers. I'm talking about members of the council, the divine council. Not only rebel, but engage in, in sexual intercourse, but lust after and copulate with human women. That, that point specifically, I think, was very controversial. Now, obviously, Second Temple um, literature has plenty of sinister characters like Satan, right? So they're not necessarily, they weren't necessarily um, contending with the notion that there are sinister beings that are in contradiction to God, but rather that the holy angels could do something so uh, lewd, could engage in such a lewd act as described in the Book of Enoch. And I think that this same... This same, what's the word I'm reaching for here? Um, this same opinion, this same, that's not the word I'm looking for. I can't think of this, uh, the, the way I want to describe this, but disgust is the word I'm looking for. The same disgust is expressed by some uh, some of the early church fathers in regard to this idea that angels could lust after and copulate with human women, because it sort of busts the paradigm, the prevailing paradigm, which was that heavenly beings are just, they're spiritual, holy beings. They, they're not capable of lust. They're not, and certainly not cap capable of sexual intercourse. Right. And so this, this idea that having to conceptualize these holy reverent beings coming down and engaging in sexual intercourse with human women was beyond the pale, I think for, for some of the early church fathers, but not, not all, certainly not all. Many of the church fathers, as I've mentioned before, um, were in favor of the not only not only consider the Book of Enoch as holy writ as scripture, but also were in favorable of its were, did, argued for its induction into the canon, including the previously mentioned Tertullian. So mm. it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't a, this a unanimous decision across the board to not include First Enoch in the in the canon. It was debated. And I understand why they didn't. I totally understand because, as I said, First Enoch itself is convoluted, and and we don't know what version they had back then. We know that that it did reflect to some extent First Enoch that we have today, the Ethiopic First Enoch, because we have the same reference in Jude, and we have the reference to the same narrative that's made by Peter, and and reference in the Old Testament as well, and by Jesus. So we have the same narrative. We know that. And we do have some of the exact same passages in the Ethiopic Enoch as they were as as whatever version was circulating in the ancient world, but it's not precisely the same manuscript. So we don't know what they were thinking about the manuscript that they had. Although I will say this, it is my contention that were we to go back in time to the first century when Jesus was walking the earth and, and after his death, when the apostles were establishing the church, were we to enter the synagogue, a synagogue, the one in Jerusalem or in any of the provinces, and, and were given access to the scrolls, to browse through the scrolls in the synagogue, right? The scripture, the scriptorium of the synagogue. We would, A, find many scrolls that are not included in our canon, that's, un, I, I think, unequivocally so. We would find scrolls that are not included in our canon. And among them would be some version of what we call the Book of Enoch. So this idea that the canon of Scripture that we have, you know, I think Christians assume that the texts that we have in our canon have always been considered the the exclusive body of holy writ by the Jews and by Christians. That's not true at all. There were many manuscripts circulating in the ancient world, both uh, before and after the birth of Christ, that did not make it into the canons of the Jews, 
which were which was formulated after the birth of Christ, as well as the Christians, hundreds of years after the birth of Christ. So what was and, and here's my wider point here, what was considered scripture then was different than what is conscripture considered scripture today. So it would not surprise me at all. Indeed, as I said, I would I would expect to find some version of Enoch among the scrolls in the scriptorium of the synagogues at the time of Christ. Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. You know, so, something else that you touched on too in your uh, introduction, um, in, in your commentary, uh, that I found fascinating. Um, how does the book of Enoch relate to ancient Mesopotamian epics? What, what do these two things have to do with each other? Well, this is, uh, this is a, a, another controversial point here. <laughs> so basically... There's two ways to think about the Book of Enoch and the ancient Mesopotamian narratives regarding the Apkalu. The Apkalu and ancient Mesop- Mesopotamian lore are equivalent to the Watchers. They are the Watchers. These were, they're sometimes referred to as the Sages, and they did exactly what the Watchers did. They taught mankind knowledge and but they're painted in 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 in, in laudatory terms in within the Mesopotamian context. In other words, they're good guys. Not always, actually. It's complicated. The Apkalu are complicated. They're sometimes good guys. <laughs> they're sometimes depicted as good guys. I would say more often than not, but not always. Not always. Um, and these, the story is generally the same. So we're we're, we're talking about the. The flood myth of the Sumerians, for example, it's generally the same as the flood myth of the Hebrews, um, with some interesting variations. But you have, you know, I think his name is Ipna Pishtu, uh, who's the Noah character in the Sumerian flood myth, who builds uh, an ark, right, and and has him and his family members and some animals are make it through the flood by way of this ark, and and previous to, to the flood, and, and it is a flood in the Sumerian account, and it is the gods who send the flood. Um, previous to the flood, you have the Apkalu, who are cohabitating with men on earth and are instructing them in the arts of heaven, the arts of civilization, in, in the divine arts, rather, the arts of civilization. So there's, these are civilizing figures. And again, they're, they're, they're equivalent to the watchers in the... In the Hebrew story. And so most scholars, nearly all scholars, would contend that the Hebraic narrative of the antediluvian world is a polemic uh, over and against the Sumerian, the Mesopotamian narrative. In other words, it's it's taking the same characters and figures and sort of flipping them on their heads and, and making the good guys the bad guys. And in, case the, in this case, the Apkalus, who are generally speaking the good guys in the Sumerian narrative and making them the bad guys in the Hebraic narrative. And so it's, it's, this is how most scholars today would describe the Book of Enoch as a polemic um, against the Mesopotamian narrative flood narrative, antediluvian narrative. Um, and, I, and so basically what that means is that the Mesopotamian narrative came first and is older and that the, the, the Hebrew scholars or the Hebrew scribes crafted their story of the antediluvian world based on the previous narrative, based on the Mesopotamian narrative, modified the Mesopotamian narrative. I disagree. I actually think it's the other way around. Because who did who founded the the according to the Bible, who founded the civilization, proto-Sumerian civilization, after the flood? It was Noah and his sons. So the Sumerians and the Akkadians and all of the Mesopotamians were the offspring of Noah, according to the Bible. And so uh, we know that something very interesting happened after the flood, according to the Bible. We know that 
there was this incident called the, the, the Tower of Babel. And God instructed the offspring of Noah, who knows how many centuries after the flood, but at some point he instructed the burgeoning population, the, the offspring, the sons and daughters of Noah and his sons, um, to spread out, to fill the earth and multiply and to, to disperse over the face of the earth. And rather than obeying this, uh, this mandate, they do, the, they do the polar opposite. They come together. They consolidate in the plains of Shinar, which is, which is in direct defiance of God, direct defiance. So you have right away this rebellion happening. You have, and I shouldn't say right away, who knows how many hundreds of years after the flood this occurred. There's a large populace. So rather than obeying the mandate, from heaven to spread out and populate the earth, they consolidate in direct defiance of God. And and I think they do this, it's my opinion that they do this under the leadership of Nimrod. And what does Nimrod's ma- name mean? We shall rebel or we will rebel. And I think that that is, it, it, that, that this, the meaning of Nimrod's name is indicative of the direct defiance of the command of heaven. They consolidate together in the plains of Shinar. We're going to rebel against the mandate of heaven and do exactly the opposite of what God is telling us to do. So what does that tell me? And of course, they build a tower and so forth. A city, really. They build a city, and in the city, a tower. And the city was Babylon. It was Babel. And the city was Babel, which had a tower, which is called the Tower of Babel. So... Um. So what do we have? What we have here is very intriguing. We have defiance of heaven taking place. So Noah would have brought from the antediluvian world all of the traditions and the culture and the language that existed in the world. He didn't reset any of that. He 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 brought it from the antediluvian world into the post-diluvian world. And so that same culture was preserved in Noah and his sons. The knowledge, if there was any kind of literature, if there was any system of writing, that came through the flood through Noah. Manuscripts, I think we should assume that if there were manuscripts in circulation, they came through the flood. Certainly, if Enoch had written something, it would have been delivered to Noah, right, who was his great-grandson. So all of the important relics from the line of Adam would have made it through the flood with Noah including whatever manuscripts. And if there were no manuscripts, if someone wants to argue that there was no writing that long ago, I would say there was. But if someone wants to argue that there wasn't, then at the very least, the oral traditions made it through the flood, through Noah and his offspring. So you tell me, what comes first here? Noah or the Sumerians? Noah comes first, does he not? According to the biblical narrative, Noah comes first, not the Sumerians. So... That proto-Sumerian culture, I think, is, is, comes out of Nimrod, comes from one of the factions that were, that were separated after Babel. Uh, that would be the proto-Sumerian culture. And then, and, then, and then you get the ancient Egyptian culture that comes out of Babel, and you get all of the different cultures that spread out from Babel, because, of course, um, because they're, they're acting in direct defiance of heaven, we will rebel. God basically comes down and enforces the issue and makes it so they literally can't accomplish this defection. They can't come together and build a city and consolidate in direct defiance of heaven. He literally makes it impossible for them to do this and forces his will, which is you're going to separate by rook or by crook, I'm going to separate you, which, in other words, you won't even be able to communicate with each other. So we're going to put an end to this. That's why God does it. He doesn't do it because he doesn't like the tower. He does it because they're in direct defiance of his mandate. And, he, and, and humankind has to spread over the earth and populate. The, the whole point is to reseed the earth, to repopulate the earth after the flood. That is what that was the decree from the kingdom of heaven. And so that's why not, God doesn't come down alone, by the way. He comes down with the council, the watchers. 
and they do this thing. They confuse the language. So out of this dispersion at Babel, you get the various cultures, according to the Bible. And you get the Mesopotamian culture. And all of these cultures, by the way, are directly influenced, although the languages are now disparate, the culture is directly influenced. The, the, let's put it this way. The root culture is Noah's culture. It's his culture. That's the root culture. So all the stories that came from Noah, all the stories, certainly all the oral traditions are now, are now going across the face of the earth right, are now being dispersed across the face of the earth with these variegated uh, factions of humans who speak different languages. And they're separating from one another. So they're getting further and further from the source material. It's a game of telephone. The oral story is modified over time. The names are changed. You know, the details are changed. And and I think there, and before that happened, I think there was an in, intention I know this is a really long-winded answer to your question. This is oh no, you're fine. <laughs> there was an in, there was an in, there was a conspiracy, let's call it, by in my estimation by Nimrod to change the antediluvian lore to take the story and invert it because he's in a state of rebellion. We will rebel, right? Not only are they rebelling in regard to the mandate of heaven to disperse and populate. They're consolidating and building. I think that Nimrod created a new religious order that placed himself at the top of the hierarchy above the sons of Noah. Because the sons of Noah were still alive when the Tower of Babel was being built and probably objected, right? So we can assume that, I think we can we can assume that there might have been an objecting, objection there. So... Nimrod is creating a new hierarchy that places himself at the top. He's inverting the stories, the oral tradition, to his, for his benefit, right? That's where the inversion of the antediluvian story happens. And, that, and from that inversion, in my opinion, you get the Sumerian account. So if I'm correct, then the scholars have it wrong. They've got it backwards, the Sumerian account, let's call it the Nimrod's rendition, is a polemic against Yahweh. It's the other way around. It's not that the Hebraic account is a polemic against the gods of Mesopotamia. I think it's literally the other way around. The Mesopotamia account is a polemic against Yahweh. And that's why the bad guys are made into the good guys. And this happens, in my estimation, before the dispersion at Babel. And so you would have that inverted story that is going all over the earth now, hmm. um, in many cases. So, um, I, and I don't understand why that point of view is not more largely considered by scholars, because everyone wants to say, oh, the Mesopotamians, and of course... The Sumerians predate the, the, Hebrew, the Hebrews. Of course they do. They, let's be specific. They predate Abraham and his offspring, Israel. They predate Israel. But they don't predate Noah. <laughs> so, um, and that's the, that's the point. They don't, pre Noah comes first, then the Sumerians, right? So if Noah comes first, then the oral traditions that were preserved by Noah are older, they have to be, right? So, so this is. I'm just kind of walking people through um, my objection to the prevailing scholarly opinions as it pertains to Enoch. Again, because they think, oh, Enoch. First of all, they think Genesis is older than Enoch. I disagree. I think Enoch is older than Genesis, and they think that. Enoch was written as a polemic against the Sumerian uh, gods and their flood narrative, which is older. Reverse that. And I think we're looking at the reality. The Sumerian account is a polemic against the god of Noah. And so um, this is my perspective, and I write about it in the introduction. Um, and whether I'm right or wrong, I don't think anyone would could ever argue, assuming, and, and you have to say this when talking about scholars today, 
assuming that Noah was a real historical character, which I obviously believe he was, but not all scholars do, assuming he was a real historical character, then you must acknowledge that he is the father of proto-Sumer of that culture. He has to be. He's the father of the ancient Egyptian culture as well. He's the father of all the cultures that, that developed in the ancient Near East, in the Fertile Crescent, right? Um, he, is, he, is, he is the, that is the, um, you might call it the mother culture, was that of Noah and his offspring. So, um, I, again, I'm just, I'm kind of su surprised that you don't encounter many scholars who are arguing that case. They just sort of adopt they just sort of adopt the notion that, oh, of course, Sumer predates Israel, and therefore, everything they write is older. Now, it's also possible that um, it's also possible that a manuscript was pre preserved through Noah, through the flood, an original manuscript written by the hand of Enoch was literally preserved, and then at some point passed down through the family line of Shem, probably from Noah, and delivered into the hands of some scholar after the, the foundation of Israel, after Abraham, right? That's also possible, that this relic was preserved through time and delivered to the offspring of Abraham at some point, and they literally had the original manuscript. That's possible. And, and again, Tertullian speculates about that uh, in in his uh, in a treatise called "On the Apparel of Women." Hmm. And I yeah, know I went way 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 off your question. Oh, no. no, no, I'm glad that you did because that brings up a really important point. That you're right; not a lot of people uh, talk about it. And but I agree with you. That's what makes most sense because. Well, I mean, that's what the Bible seems to teach. And, and just when you look back in history, it's who's going to be copying off of who, you know, is it going to be the pagan cultures or is it going to be, uh, is it going to be, um, God's, God's people? And so, no, what, what, what you said makes perfect sense to me. And I, I agree with you. I think that's most likely to be true as well. Well, I do have a lot, uh, I do have some more that I want to ask you specifically about some of the prophecies, uh, in Enoch. But before I do, where can, uh, people pick up your book and follow you online? Uh, they can get uh, our book of Enoch. This is the proof copy, so it's got this line in the middle of it, but this is what it looks like. Disregard that that line in the middle. This is what our copy of Enoch looks like. Uh, they can get it on Amazon. And I believe we're going to make signed copies available should, should anyone desire to sign copy through the Blurry Creatures podcast website. But but they can get – right now they can go to Amazon and get and – get, uh, the physical copy. Also, we have a digital copy coming, and we're working on an audio version as well. So, but right now, the 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 print copy is available on Amazon. Fantastic. Well, I highly suggest everybody go check that out. We have more to talk about with Timothy Almarino, but we're going to do that in the members only section. So, if you haven't had a chance yet, head on over to dailyrenegade.com and get a membership today. It's only $10 a month or 100 a year. And I'd suggest getting the 100 a year if you can do it because it's cheaper in the long run. Essentially, you get two months for free doing it that way. If you're viewing right now on dailyrenegade.com, just hang on the line and we'll get back to our conversation. Everyone else viewing for free on YouTube or elsewhere, thank you so much. And until next time, take care and God bless.